Good morning. How's everybody? Thank you, Pastor Seb, for inviting me. I'm so glad to be with you. For those who are here and also those who are at home, bless you. Bless you with God's presence and peace. I pray that, uh, you know, the people of God, we are called to thrive. Not strive, but to thrive. To overcome and to rise above. And so I want to bless you with that, that uh, no matter what is going through around you or inside of uh, your heart, you, you will be strong, okay? You will remain strong in Jesus. Will somebody say amen? Amen. Blessed is the man who do not laugh at the preacher wearing a shield. Okay, uh, I'm trying to get used to this. Just now in the first service, I was trying to scratch my nose and uh, I felt terribly. Okay, will you turn to John chapter 4? John chapter 4. Hallelujah. This morning, I want to share on living waters. I felt the Lord has uh, put this in my heart and uh, there are many powerful things that I'm hearing from the Lord from even this, this passage of Scripture that, in, that directly uh, implicates us that if we capture what God's Spirit wants to say to us this morning, I know that you, at home or on site, you will feel something different, something will be ignited inside of you, okay? And so we want to talk about living waters this morning. Are you ready? Okay? Starting from verse 3. <clears throat> And Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through. Take note of that. He needed to go through. So Jesus came to the city of Samaria, which was called Suka, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the six hour, six hour, twelve noon. Okay, six hour, twelve noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, question one master, twelve disciples, twelve disciples to go buy makan and left the master alone. I don't understand. Okay. Then the woman of uh, Samaria said to him, how is it that, oh wait, wait, I missed something. Okay, yeah. a woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who... It is who, asks, uh, who says to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him to give you the living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered her and said, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I, sh I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water. Listen again. But the water that I give him will become in in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst nor come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, 
The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, verse 27, and at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, take note, the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives the wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you have not laboured, others have laboured, but and you have entered into their labours. This is a familiar story. How many of you have uh, read or have heard message on John four by John, uh, from John four before? Yeah, okay. And it's, but yet it's a powerful, powerful story. And uh, recent weeks, I, I I felt the spirit of God um, really just zoom me in and landed me on this message on this passage of scripture. And I've been learning from from Him uh, so many powerful things as I dig into it. And um, there are, there are kingdom truths there that if we would hear what His Spirit wants to deposit upon our hearts this morning, I believe God is going to, uh, there's something is going to happen inside of you, okay? And so we're going to talk about living waters. What's that? What does that do? Key question, do you have it? What is living water? What is, what's living water? What does that do? And do you have living water? Now, this morning, very simple not really like a preaching three-point sermon, but we are going to look at one woman, one king, and one conversation. One woman, one king, and we're going to zoom in more on the conversation because that's where the powerful, powerful truth would come forth. This woman is a Samaritan woman. Now, let me just give us, some of us may know, some of us may not, but just a refresher, that the, the Samaritan, Turns the uh, people from Samaria, they were originally considered like the people of God. You will find uh, their details in Deuteronomy 27. Okay, and and there, there's that place where Moses said, "Okay, on this mount, Mount Gerizim, this is the place to worship." And so the Samaritans were not a, a group of pagans and and uh, wicked people. They were religious. They were spiritual people. In fact. Until John 4, you still see that this is something that they are conscious about, worship, about God, about Yahweh. Okay? Just that over time, this group of people have intermarriage with uh, other uh, people around the nations and, and they got into intermarriages and they, they got into idolatry. And the Jews who are very pious, very uh, they stick hard to the law, they, they begin to consider the Samaritans uh, to be half baked, okay, mixed, uh, mixed blood and all. And so they despised them, they rejected them. So the Samaritans were rejected and totally unliked by the Jews to a point that the Jews would avoid having any form 
of a meeting or conversations with them. It's very interesting that Jesus would tell the parable of the good Samaritan. And so what happened is this. They, uh, from, now the Bible tells us in verse 3 that Jesus was uh, from in Judea heading to Galilee. Okay, And you know, when you look at the map, from Galilee and Judea, it's a straight road. So from Judea to Galilee, it's just, it's just cut across Samaria. And you'll get there the fastest, the easiest way. But Jews, and that on those day, at this, those, those days, they will avoid Samaria altogether. So from Judea, they will take a huge detour just to get to Galilee. So it's almost like Thompson Medical. Okay, Thompson Medical, all of us are there, and we want to come to Care Point. All right, what's the fastest road? Through Ballastia. Okay, right, through Ballastia. And so literally, the Jews so hate Ballastia, Samaria, that from Thompson Medical, they will head out to PIE, exit uh, Stevens, go down Orchard Road, all the way down City Hall, head back to Bugis, and then come to Galilee, Care Point. This is how much the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. And that's why Jesus, uh, the, the woman was curious and kind of shocked. Say, what, what are you as a Jew talking to me? There's no dealings uh, with Jews and Samaritans. But this woman is more than just a Samaritan person, a Samaritan uh, woman. She is also a broken woman. She's also a broken woman. She's an outcast. You see, we know that because she was drawing water in a hot noon sun. Under the hot noon sun, she's drawing water. In those times, women would wake up to do their chores, their marketing, their, their washing, drawing of water in the morning when it's not so hot. So the crowds, the women, the community will be at the well drawing water, fellowshipping probably, okay? And then at the well, and they will depart. And only then, this woman, the Samaritan woman, would come out at 12 noon to draw water. Now, why? Because she is an outcast of her society. Because the society have considered her as an adulterous person, a loose woman, five husbands. We can't even live with one, right? She has five husbands. And the one she was cohabiting with is not even her husband. And so she was considered adulterous. She was considered loose woman. She was not welcome. That's why she had to draw water on her own at 12 noon. And for years, we know and can assume that she was living in a state of sin and in a place of shame, constant shame and permanent social distancing. But the Samaritan woman represents all of us. Let's not look at the Samaritan woman and say, wow, what a terrible person. No, all of us are like her. Because when we stand before Christ and the cross, we are equal. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory. And so none of us are better. None of us are worse. We are equally broken, equally damned to hell, if not for Christ. Will somebody say amen? And so this woman really represents all of us in so many ways. We were in the state of sin and oppression. We were in the state of shame. I'm sure even as you're listening online and on site, there will, be, there will be areas in your life that is secret. Not even your spouse know. It's a secret sin. It's a secret struggle. We are living with that. All of us, no excuse. So we are all in bondage without Christ. And this woman... Is dysfunctional in society. And some of us too. Some of us may struggle in our culture, in our society, in our workplace, at home. We feel that we are a sore thumb. Everywhere we go, we just have relation issues, friendship issues. Do you know? So we can identify with this woman at the well. However, there's something extra about the Samaritan woman. When we look, we can see that she's also a very spiritually hungry person. How many of you are spiritually hungry? Let me see your hands. Yeah? Okay. And this woman, you can tell that there is a God-shaped void that was waiting for God to fill 
and to satisfy, just like what your pastor said. Something was burning within her heart for truth. For the moment in that conversation where she realized that Jesus was a spiritual man, a prophet, she straight away, the question that she's burning in her heart came out. She changed the subject altogether and she said, wait, wait, wait a minute. Oh, I, I, okay, you must be a prophet. I have this burning question. You Jews say we must worship in Jerusalem, but we Samaritans say we must worship on this mountain, Gerizim. So, which is which? So there was a pursuit for truth. She was longing to walk in truth, to find maybe presence. And this is so significant because we can be broken and not know. But we can be broken and yet hungry to pursue truth so that we can be restored. These are the big difference. The good news of the kingdom is found and is only welcome, can only be welcomed by the poor in spirit. Matthew 5, remember? Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom. You know, you don't need the kingdom. The kingdom is not going to come to you and I if we are not wanting the kingdom. If you are king on the throne of your life, then the kingdom of God has no place inside of you. But yet, the kingdom of God is released and given freely to those who will say, I am bankrupt in this life. Even with the money in my bank and the resources that I have, the res assets that I have, the great job that I have, I am still spiritually bankrupt without God. God, this is the end of me. You know what? When we come to the end of us, that's the beginning of God. The kingdom comes. Isaiah 57, verse 17, uh, 15. Isaiah 57, verse 15 says, For thus says the God who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. You know, God is king. His throne is in the heavens. And he said to David, when David wanted to build him a house, he said, what can you build? What can man build for me to contain my presence? But yet, God says, I will come to the heart that's looking for me. I will come to that person that's broken and contrite and I will reside on him. So God is not looking for buildings to, to fill. God's presence is looking for hearts to become home for him. Will somebody say amen? And so many of us can identify with this Samaritan woman. But it was just another ordinary day for her, alone, broken, outcast, at noon, drawing water when there's no one, no one to talk to, no one to fellowship with. But there was a divine encounter with the Messiah King. Let's look at Jesus, the King. Now, we know Jesus. He's more than an ordinary Jew. He's more than just a man. He is Lord and her maker. And he is also one who is on assignment by the Father. That's why Jesus said I have to, uh, he had to go through Samaria. Why? Because later he says, my food is to do the will of the Father. And so he is a servant down on earth to represent the Father, to reach the people that the Father loved. And so here is Jesus, more than a man, but he is king. He is Lord, he's maker, and he's a servant to the Father's purposes. And so Christ came and something beautiful, the broken was met with beauty. The woman that was so broken in life was met with the beauty of Jesus. And we're going to look at it, especially as we zoom into the conversation, we see the beauty of Jesus. We see how Jesus would come and invite the broken and the thirsty into something that is so much more and so much more powerful. One conversation as we zoom in. Look at this conversation. 
This conversation took place at a, such a significant place. A well is a, a great backdrop for this whole conversation. It's like the stage, you know, you have a presentation and right in the middle of this drama, dialogue, conversation was a well. But this well is not an ordinary well. It's a spiritual well historical well. It's a well that, is, that has been provided for by a father, an earthly father. His name is Jacob. It's a historical well. It has so many stories, so many encounters, that well. And the people love and consider that well to be such a significant well. And the woman said, Are you greater than Jacob? There should be a resounding Yes! Are you greater than Jacob? The woman asked Jesus. It's a resounding yes. Because now he is Jesus. He, she's talking and she didn't know yet, about to know. She didn't know yet that he, he is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the long-awaited the, the long promise to bring salvation upon the earth. What is so beautiful, such a great play out. Historical well by a father, Jacob, provided by a father, Jacob. Now Jesus standing at that same well and say, wait, woman, you do not know because the father in heaven have just provided a well of eternal living water. That if anyone should thirst, they only need to come and drink and it will be theirs. Christ is the living water. Christ is the provision by the Father for all of us. Will somebody say amen? You can say amen, huh? Okay. <laughs> Woman, give me water to drink. Then we see the conversation started. You know how beautiful Jesus is? Because Jesus knew her state of sin, right? He's a prophet, he's king, he's Lord, he's maker. He knows our sin. He knows where we are. He knows the state of sin that this woman was living in and, and he met her at her hour of shame, carrying her water pot. And every time she carries the water pot in the noonday to draw water, it's a reminder that she's an outcast. She's not welcome in the community. She's alone. She's broken. There, Jesus met her at the state of sin and the hour of shame. But look at, look, at, look at the beauty of Christ. Do you know in John chapter 1, it says that Jesus is the fullness of grace and the fullness of truth. He's not a balance between grace and truth. Some of us are balanced between grace and truth. So sometimes we are gracious and sometimes we are truth. Okay, So when we are truth, we have no grace. But sometimes when we are so gracious, we compromise truth. But Jesus is not a balance of grace and truth. Jesus, the fullness of grace and fullness of truth. You cannot separate Him from grace and truth. Will somebody say amen? And so when He deals with us, just like how He dealt with the Samaritan woman, it is still true, full on, but full on grace. Jesus knew her state of sin. She, Jesus knew her shame. But Jesus in that conversation began to gently, graciously lead her to truth. What is the truth? The truth is her real need. Her real need is not the thing that will con be contained in the water pot. Her real need is for salvation. So question to all of us online and right here on site. What is salvation? I asked a group that I was uh, talking to and I said, what is salvation? And some said, reconciliation back to the Father. Good. Healing. Yeah. God set me free from my sin and oppression and bondage. Good. Yeah, I have peace in my heart. Good. Then I said, all these are part of salvation, but salvation is really a person. Salvation is called Jesus Christ. Salvation is God in heaven coming down as Emmanuel, His presence with us and in us. So salvation is not the works and the fruits that we get from salvation. Salvation is 
the person, the presence of Christ in us that produces healing, that releases us from bondages. Okay, are you understanding this? It is not wholeness. Wholeness is the byproduct of salvation, but it's oneness. Oneness with Christ, union with Christ, that as we are in Him and He is in us, the byproduct is we are healed, we are restored, we are reconciled back to the Father. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so it is so important for us to relook, refocus, put our attention back, put the priority back on His presence. Because it's so easy to do the Christian life and the Christian things without presence. It's so easy, it's possible. I've been a worship leader before and it's so easy. I can just lean on my gift to lead worship. Presence here or not, don't matter. We can have prayer meeting, but the absence of presence. You can say you are a Christian, but you can do your life without Christ, then high chance, think again. So salvation is a person, is the presence of God, is Christ. And so in that conversation, Christ was leading that woman, that broken, dehydrated, thirsty, in life and in spirit, leading her to himself. He was offering himself as the living water. And she said, give me this living water. Do you know, it's a difference. All of us are thirsty. But some just choose to live in denial that they are thirsty. And they busy themselves trying to make things work, thinking that they are not so thirsty. But when those who are really able, like the woman, say, I am thirsty and I need a drink, that's when living waters come. And so she said, give me that living water. See, the moment she say, give me, she is inviting herself into the well. And the well is about to invade her life. She believed, listen, watch me. She believed the words of Jesus. She took a sip. And that sip of living water multiplied into a river. Listen again. When we believe, we take a sip of His water, of His presence. And what is inside of us becomes a fountain and a river. John chapter 7, verse 37 says, On the last and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Let me say that. Anyone who is thirsty, come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, rivers of living waters will flow. Didn't say might, it will flow from within them. She took a sip. She believed. The moment she said, give me, she believed. She took a sip of the presence and something supernatural transpired. Something supernatural is released. So what happened? First thing she did, the woman at the well left her water pot. Do you know, if you want the living water, you got to get rid of your water pot. The water pot represents how we sustain our life on this earth. That is not sustaining, that's just existing. That's just prolonging death. But there's life that God wants to release to us. She left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, verse 29, come and see who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Oh, wait a minute. She's talking to a people that she's not supposed to talk to. She's an outcast, remember? She is not welcome. No one has any regard for her. She's a sinful woman. She's, she's a sinful woman. She's an adulterous woman. She's a loose woman. But she went back to talk to the people that rejected her. What happened? 
that one sip of his presence, living water, something changed. No longer hiding in her shame. 12 noon sun, drawing water. Now she went back to the people that rejected her and she released that river by speaking. And then verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. Oh, look, the river began to multiply. One sip, she believed. Change began to happen. When she went out back to her community, many Samaritans of the city began to believe. And he told me all that I ever did. Verse 40, when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And Jesus stayed there two days. Listen, multiply it again. Verse 41, and many more. One Samaritan woman believed, took a sip, and she brought back that presence to a people that was not welcoming her. And the river began to multiply. And from many Samaritans to many more believed to a point where they testified. Oh, wait, look at verse 42. Interesting. It says, Then they said to the woman, wait, wait a minute. Just an hour ago, you rejected this woman. You're not supposed to talk to her. She's a loose woman. Can you see restoration? Can you see it's not just reviving her individual life, but restoration of her life back to community and society? And they said to her, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him and know. This is what happens. When we take a sip of the presence of Christ, of salvation, something inside of us changes. And when we begin to move around speaking and, and we are releasing his presence to many more. And literally our words is releasing his presence. They literally heard him and encountered Jesus. Took a sip of living water. His presence. Not only was she revived, restored. Do you know she became the first evangelist? Most of the time, Jesus, when he healed somebody, he said, don't tell anybody that I'm Messiah. Demons say, ah, son of God. No, no, shut up, okay? No, you keep quiet. Don't tell anybody. You be silent. But here, she re he, the Messiah, revealed himself to her. He said, woman, I am the Messiah. The one who's talking to you, I am he. Do you know God reveals himself personally in revelation to those who are hungry? God is not found by casual seekers. There are too many casual seekers in churches. Too many casual Christians. No fear of God. No, res no, no, no respect or regard for God. No hunger whatsoever. But God is looking. The Father is looking for true worshippers. Yeah? And so this woman took a sip. And that sip of living water began to multiply into a river. She believed, many believed, many more believed. So what's the key in the conversation? The broken met with the beauty. And the next B in the conversation is the truth. Believe. Simply believe. We have complicated something that God has made simple. We come out, you know, oh, five steps to do this, ten ways to do this. And in the kingdom, one step. For we were transported and set free from the power of darkness into His marvelous light. One step. Repent, confess, and you are saved. One step. Oh, we come out with so many classes. Believe. Believe His word. Immediately is activated. But wait, the message by the Holy Spirit through John doesn't end there. Let's look on in verse 43. Now, after two days, Jesus departed from there and went to Galilee. 
For he himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. This is the Jews now, not Samaritans. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him. Why? Because they remembered the miracle of water into wine. They have seen all the things Jesus did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana okay, of Galilee where he had made the water wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him, employed him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. Verse 48, please note. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. What did the woman at the well do? She was having a conversation by the words alone of Christ. She believed and the supernatural was released. The living water was released into her. She believed by hearing the word. Here, God's people required signs. They depended on the works, not the words. They believe only after they see the works. Some Christians are like that. Oh, God is good. He's a good, good father. Why? Because he answered my prayer. I got double promotion. You know, I'm so blessed. Then a few months later, oh, I lost my job. God is not so good. So their faith is dependent on signs and wonders. So when they don't see the signs, they wonder. Really? Wow, what happened? But a woman believed by his word. So what kind of a Christian are you? Are you a believer that believes according to the word? Or are you a believer you believe and follow because of the signs? Verse 49. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. Oh, that's the word. Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word. The man believed the word. The man didn't do anything. He believed the word. He heard the word and he believed the word. Know why? The word of King Jesus is decree. When a king speaks, his word is law, is decree. It will happen. When God said, let there be light, there was light. We must understand the power of God and his word. And so the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Verse 51. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. Now, see multiplication. The nobleman heard the word, believed he received living water salvation is a person is presence and when we receive the presence we receive what the presence brings about he himself believed and his whole household can you see that one sip of the living water became a fountain within him of hope Faith, his pre the presence of God now within him. But when he went back, his whole entire household believed. Multiplication. Listen, folks, church, you are so powerful. If you just understand God's mind when he created you, that he, there is a God-shaped void, yes, but it's meant for his presence to fill you with the bread of heaven, like what your pastor said, and the living water. The two things that you need to be sustained in life. Don't exist. Live. Live in His presence. In Him we live and move and have our being. It is in Him. 
Church, don't do life without presence. Don't do church without presence. Jeremy, don't do anything without presence. This woman coming back to her. This woman was broken, but she met with a beautiful king. In that conversation, the truth, one truth was released. Simply believe. Three Bs. Broken, beautiful, believe. Just believe. Just believe. Whatever he says, just do it. He is the living water. He offers himself, his presence to us. If anyone is thirsty, let him come and drink. Something happens. Rivers of living water will flow. There is a place for all of us to receive and release His presence. Release His presence in another part. But this morning is about receiving His presence. You know, COVID-19, I'm sure many of us are affected some way or another. And it's tough to go through storms in life without a God who is above the storms. It's tough to go through life, many storms, and there will be greater storms. Just now, Pastor and I, we were in our office and we were just dialoguing. And greater storms are coming, church. The question is, who is with you in the storm? Is Jesus in the boat? With you? When we believe His Word, His presence, like living water, comes in, grows within us, multiplies the presence, the influence and the power and the might of Jesus begin to be formulated. It will be formed like a great river within us and it will overflow. Christian faith is about the overflow. Evangelism is not your talk and my talk. Nobody is going to be saved because of our great eloquence. But it's going to be the overflow of His presence. Look at the woman. She took a sip, went back to a community that didn't welcome her, and the town had a revival. Did she preach anything? No. She simply said, Could this be Christ? She released the river. How many of you are thirsty this morning? If you are thirsty this morning, as we close, would you just stand? And wherever you are standing, okay, and those watching online, also shut in with God. Man, I just realized I look so funny. Huh? <laughs> but God is here in this room. Will somebody say amen? So in these closing moments, if you want to take a drink, you hear the invitation to come to the living water. Wherever you're standing, lift up both hands to heaven and say, Lord, like the Samaritan woman, I don't deny, Lord, that I'm broken. I'm sinful. I'm self-sufficient. I have pride, I have stubbornness But Lord, today I put it all aside Lord, I say I am bankrupt without Jesus I need your presence I need your presence I need the living water If that's you, yeah, lift up both hands You know, simply believe Simply believe You don't even need to feel anything Though I believe you will But you, it's not about the signs and wonders No, 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 no It's belief Nobleman went Simply believe hearing the word and the miracle happened yep just shut in with God for a while hallelujah